This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And we're going to go slightly off format today. This is just going to feature my conversation with Rain Wilson. His fans know all about him and his portfolio. And of course, in fact, uh, he's in, in a recent uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, do I call it a mini series? We'll find out. Uh, and it's on a subject. That Depends on if it has a season two. If it has only <laughs> season one, it's a, it's a mini series. <laughs> Rain Wilson, welcome to Star Talk, dude. Thank uh, you. So, uh, this one, I'm calling this my co- cosmic crib because we're just. You and I are just chilling. Normally, I have like a co-host and experts and all that. It's just you and I having a conversation, reaching for our geek roots. No, I that's... love it. That's awesome. Let's do this. <laughs> so um, you're best known. And do you hate it when people say he's best known for? Do you hate that when people do that? No, no. Come on. I mean, it's just true. I'm best known it's just for true. Dwight Schrute and uh, that... In the office, that, and and how many seasons did that go? That like it was nine seasons. That's ten crazy. Seasons. Every time yeah. I turn on, there's the office, you know. <laughs> yep, yep. And so it I just is. want just congratulations for being a fixture in that show, and especially most recently, um, you have a, a show that dropped, a nine part show that dropped, uh, and it's called Utopia, in which right. you play a virologist. Oh, yeah. So uh, we'll have to get to the bottom of that, and. Yep. Also, you've got a, a, a podcast of your own, um, yep. Soul Pancake. Is that? Yep. Will, yep. will I ever yep. be on Soul Pancake? Will I? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. You wouldn't make the cut. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. um, you're not legit enough. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a podcast called Metaphysical Milkshake. Uh, I did uh, with Reza Aslan. Um, the, oh, so Soul Pancake is your production group and Soul Pancake. It. It's but it's Soul Pancake is the company that I co-founded. It's um, it's a digital media company. So it's Soul Pancake presents Metaphysical Milkshake. They're very much a part of it. It's it's kind of in the whole Soul Pancake vibe, which is about exploring life's big questions and making uplifting content and bringing people together. And and our podcast is is in sync with that. Does that work today because no one wants uplifting content they thrive on conflict and tribalism so so how's that working out (laughs) well um yes how is that working out you know you're not following the facebook model there is there is a large percentage of the population that is looking for uplifting content and unifying content and something that contains hope and uh and joy even um and, you know, I just look at, I mean, you, you saw the documentary, The Social Dilemma, yes? Yes, yes, yes. Um, very, so, very interesting. I mean, it went, got, got right to the heart of the problems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, I knew a lot of the stuff that was in it before. A lot of people watch it and are like, well, I knew all that. It's like, well, yeah, I knew it, but it, it wasn't put together in a, in, in a, the puzzle pieces weren't put together in, uh, in, a, in, in such a uh, out coherent way and and you see that so much of the division going on in the world right now is is this facebook model um if if they can get you outraged they get you clicking buttons more and they get more ads and they make more money so uh, outrage and division fuels commerce so we're a digital media company yes we would like people to watch our videos but we're trying to combat this by bringing people together and using the best aspects of the web and of youtube and uh digital content that is so noble i mean I'm, I'm proud of you and i hope it succeeds by greater than all measures because then others would then emulate it and then it would maybe be this force of attraction uh, away yeah from all that, yeah. is, that continues to divide us and what's this in that same uh, production company an idiot's guide to climate change oh so yes you- you'll dig you dig this do, do I, I keep wanting to say dr tyson it's, it's Dr. Neil to you. <laughs> just Neil. Just Neil. Please. I know, but I keep wanting to say Dr. Tyson. Why is that? You command um, such respect. I never want to call anyone a doctor. Even my own doctor I call. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it is fascinating. Many people call me that, and I never, I don't introduce myself that way. Yeah, yeah. But when I give public talks, I say, here's Dr. No, I don't. But so so I have to receive it as a, as an, as a, an unsolicited honorific. Yeah. Okay. And good. It warm, good. I'm warmed by it, but still, it's it's not necessary. Yeah. Um. Well. Okay, Neil. All right, Neil. <laughs> Shut the f- up. Here's here's what we're gonna do. Um. 
So, no, you would dig this show, uh, An Idiot's Guide to Climate Change. Here's what we did. I, I, was, I got involved with this nonprofit called Arctic Base Camp that basically explores the science of how climate change is affecting the Arctic and tries to really impart that information to movers and shakers. Because as you know, in the world of climate change, what's happening in the Arctic is far more extreme than what's happening even in California. I mean- Yeah, in fact, when they say we're warming the earth by one or two degrees, that, that's the average. The Arctic gets a much bigger hit from that. Exactly, uh, almost than, double than, what than, we're feeling in North America double, right now. So right. Uh, I got invited to take a trip with them to Iceland and Greenland and meet some scientists that were working up there. And so we didn't really have a budget for Soul Pancake. It's a, you know, it's a smallish company. So, but on like a $60,000 budget, we were able to kind of pull together. I kind of documented myself on this trip up to Greenland and we made it a six part series. Greta with, Thunberg okay. mm -hmm. is on the series. And the whole point of it was like, listen, there's a lot of people that believe in the science of climate change. Of course, as you always say, you don't believe in science. Science just right, right, of is. But wait, wait, but, wait, wait, just put, wait, back up for a second. How did you, you can't just fly to Greenland. So how, how did this happen? So getting to Greenland was, uh, was a bitch. The scientists, Dr. Gail Whiteman, who's the founder of Arctic Base Camp, and there were a bunch of other scientists that were working up there. And she was like, we were going to do a bunch of events. And she was like, Rain, I'm going up there to meet with these scientists. You should come along and just see firsthand what's going on. We'll document it and mm -hmm. you can make it into this little series. And then, as you know, you can speak to science much more when you've kind of like lived it and gone through it. So the point of the show though, Neil, was that there's a lot of people that buy the science. There's a lot of people that don't buy the science and think it's kind of a crazy liberal conspiracy. But there are some people in the middle. There are some young people in the middle that are kind of getting it from both sides that, you know, maybe they've got a crazy right wing uncle that doesn't buy. The yeah, at science. Thanksgiving. It all happens at Thanksgiving. At Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner table. <laughs> exactly. And but maybe their friends at school are climate activists and, you know, or something like that. So uh, do fire drill Fridays with Jane Fonda or something. So they don't know what to think. So I tried to make it like I'm the doofus. I'm the idiot. Um, going, who doesn't know anything about climate change, wants to learn something that's going on this this trek. So it's fun. I try and use humor. It's it's kind of, you know, off putting, and um, uh, <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. We had uh, Greta so did you, Thunberg did, was on it, and, and we had excellent. Did you glean any tactics, any tools, or the tools of communication from that trip? You know, that's a great question. I didn't. I I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, just oh, keep. <laughs> I'm. Where will I go? What will I do? I'm sorry. I'm despairing. I, I thought you said you, you were right hopeful, dude. I thought you said. Um, I do think that we just need to keep fighting the good fight and try and, and really work with young people. You know, people over 40 or 50, they got their minds made up. You know, they're never going to change their minds. So Yeah, it um, does seem to be demographically split that way. That, that's a fascinating fact. And so that, yeah. therefore, the younger demographic, that they're tactically different. If you're trying to get some of them yeah. off the fence versus, you're right, the old ossified Exactly, so try folks. and reach some of the young people. And, and we can make a difference. If we make extreme changes right now throughout the world, we can meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. It's going to be really, really hard, but we can do it, and we just have to keep believing. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Okay, well, that, that's hopeful. And do you think, uh, so <laughs> I'm just wondering if there should be tourist jaunts to Greenland to, so they can see. That might help. Because I always think, what I think the flat earthers are a conspiracy just so that they're the first ones to go into space, because that's where we're going to want to send them, so they can see the round <laughs> earth firsthand. So they get a free, just send them on, get, just do that now. But you know and what? So it's, you don't even need to go to space. You can just fly, <laughs> you can fly to Europe, and you're up so high, like the sun's rising, you see the curve of the earth. Oh, it's so not... Here, no, here's okay. what you do. You send them up into space and say... You have to confess Earth is round, otherwise we're not bringing you back. <laughs> oh, there you go. Perfect. Um, that, that, I would not suggest bringing people to Greenland, mostly because the carbon footprint is so big. And I talk about that in the series, but just flying to Greenland, it's so much gas and taxis and whatnot. I mean, the only way to do it is if you're going to, like, I'm going to plant a, a freaking forest when I'm done flying to Greenland. Mm, but, um, just to make up and, for it. 
and, and, and it, Greta's quite Greta's quite the ambassador in it. Was she, she on is. the same trip with you, or did come in a, go in another time? No, uh, this guy who's on our board, Callum Greaves, works with her and her organization, so he was able to kind of patch her in, and we did it. We shot remotely with her. She didn't go on the trip, but okay. she's a firebrand, man. It's it's yeah, remarkable what she's really doing. really good. Yeah, doing that right. So so now you 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 have a show that just dropped like days ago from the from yes. this moment of this recording. And I already know people who have binged the entire series. And I said, yeah. damn. <laughs> so, I, so I confess, I just read some of the reviews. I haven't seen any of them yet. But I okay. just like the fact that you're a virologist. But it, it, in Utopia, it is curiously, weirdly syn- syn- Synchron- uh, synchronized, 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 synchronized yes. synchronized some with overlap with, with our yes. current... A pandemic so what's yeah. up with that um it's pretty crazy man i mean this is based on a british show utopia was on the bbc a long time ago like 10 years ago as was the office uh, based thank on a you british show. thank you yes yeah. and in yeah. fact we're fighting that same battle there are these mm-hmm. hardcore fanboys of the british Ooh. original series are like the american series sucks it's gonna <laughs> fail it's terrible <laughs> and um so it always makes more money in America than in England. So, but I don't, I don't yeah. get that argument because no one's taking away that TV show. Like no mm-hmm. one, when we made the American Office, we didn't take all copies of the British Office and like burn them. Like no <laughs> one can watch them. Like you can watch them over and over and over. Plus, again. it's an American office show in an American office, right? Yeah. It's not Americans in a British location, right? Yes, so exactly. You, you but Utopia is thing. the same thing. So, and it's been. Being developed for years, Gillian Flynn was a showrunner and creator of our version, and um, it's all about conspiracy theories. Which but the parallels were, are creepy. So, so give yeah. give me a give me a like a you know three sentence overview of uh, what you're doing a, and, and a group how it's of creepy. comic book geeks discover a graphic novel that contains the keys to the destruction of humanity, which includes uh, crazy viruses and a, and a supervillain named Mister Rabbit. Okay, that's how it begins. <laughs> How's that? And then it takes off from there. Okay. And then it, and it's all it's all downhill. Yeah, it's so it's conspiracy theory thriller with some science fiction and um, and drama and really dark uh, sense of humor. I call it Stranger Things meets Quentin Tarantino. Oh, oh, so it's got some blood, blood and glory. Yeah, it has, too. it has, yeah, human heads. Being okay, smashed. so tell me, tell me about the virus. What's the virus up to in this storytelling? Yeah, so in this story, there, my, I play a virologist, Dr. Michael Stearns, who discovered a really obscure virus in the Andes Mountains in Peru that killed a couple hundred members of the Peruvian military. And so I studied it and I created a, a super vaccine that not only inoculates it but cures the no, disease. No, let me guess. Uh, you're a scientist. You call this to people's attention, and no one listens to you. <laughs> no one listens. No <laughs> me, one cares. Me, I'm, just, I'm just spitballing there. Yeah. Let me just... yep. <laughs> exactly. So All right. then I'm so I'm just relegated to kind of researching this virus in the basement of my college in Chicago. I'm a small potatoes guy, and then there happens to be this huge pandemic sweeping America. And the parallels between my virus and this one are very stunning. And so it does turn out that my virus is the virus that is killing hundreds or thousands in America. So all of a sudden I get thrust into the spotlight and I become this very, very unlikely hero. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's good to have a scientist as a hero, even if it's in a, a, a gory, weird storytelling. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. Usually the scientist gets long forgotten after you pass them by in the beginning of this of a storytelling. So I'm happy to, to learn of this. Yeah. yeah. And 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 the it, is there does it also address social cultural things like fear vaccines and this sort of thing? Yes. Yes, it does. And and it, it was amazing. So we shot this thing. We finished this thing in September. The virus, the Wuhan virus started in December. The pandemic was in February or March, and um, we were texting each other like January, February, March, like, what is happening here? Is our (laughs) show coming true? This is nuts. Because not only is it the virus, but there's a whole segment of the show that's about the vaccines, the production of vaccines, rushing the vaccine to market. How are we going to get this vaccine out? Um, Who should take it? What it means is 
you have a really effective PR firm. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> Apparently like, yeah. That's, I guess that's it. But, yeah, that's uh, a, they started the Wuhan virus. Yes, Your yes. PR firm. I think <laughs> I, I'm waiting for, because this is an Amazon show, I'm waiting for the conspiracy theory that Jeff Bezos started the virus in order to promote Utopia on Amazon Prime. But. And, and with everyone, with the virus, no one is going out, so everyone needs their stuff shipped. So that's the Amazon. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the only one. You know, he'll he'll be a trillionaire by the time this is over. Yeah, he, he so Rain, is. we got to we got to take a quick break. But when we come yeah. back, uh, more with Rain Wilson, uh, one of our uh, patron uh, geek saints out there, yes. and we're going to take questions from our own fan base, specifically our Patreon patrons. When Star Talk returns, we're back. Star Talk. A cosmic crib edition where we're um, in conversation with Rain Wilson, who's an actor and I just learned a climate activist. Yeah. And okay, can I call you that, Rain? A climate sure. activist? Sure. Why not? Yeah, I'll take you'll, it. You'll take it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so right now in this portion, we we're gonna solicit, we've solicited questions from our fan base. And we're going to lead off with uh, Patreon members. These are the folks who who actively support. Our podcast. So uh, we got a question right here for you, Rain. All right. So when reading and memorizing scripts for a science-heavy show like Utopia, how much of what you need and learn sticks with you and furthers your understanding of science in general? Also, just wondering, what was your favorite comic book character? Ah, nice. Okay, good. Why don't you answer that first? Because that's presumably a fast, fast question. Um, Favorite comic book character? So here's the deal with me and comic books. So I was a huge comic book nerd as a child. And then around 11 or 12, I discovered these things, Neil, called books. They don't have pictures in them. There's no pictures. Mm. There's just stories. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just giving him, I'm giving him shit. I, uh, (laughs) I switched over to science fiction, but I have in the other room of our house, I have my 1970s and 1980s science fiction book collections, like 400 books that I read when I was a teenager. So Dungeons and Dragons and science fiction books were how I lived my teenage years. Uh, But uh, favorite, ultimately favorite comic book character, um, I loved Superman at first and then Green Lantern because I figured out that Green Lantern could kick Superman's butt. Uh, by just making a kryptonite shell around him. But then I always was, I really loved Thor. I, Because I, I, I loved mythology and I loved the way that it blended kind of Norse myths and mythological characters with superheroes. So I, I was really big into Thor. Excellent. So if you're first into Superman and later into Thor, those are the two authentic alien superheroes. They come from other planets. That's Just true. To put that in context, in case you That's never thought true. About that. I hadn't really even uh, thought about that. I guess because yeah. I've oh. always felt like an alien myself, kind of a <laughs> skin. So there you have it. Okay, so now tell me, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I actually claim cameo appearances in five feature-length films, but that doesn't make me an actor. And if I'm playing myself, I don't really have to prepare for it. So as an actor. What is the relationship between preparing for a role where that role has expertise hmm. and and what might be real expertise that you'd glean along the way? I That's mean, this the question is, that was just asked. Yeah, yeah, this is a great it's a great question and I get asked this one a lot. Um I fortunately, you know, I spent years playing a paper salesman and I didn't have to do a whole lot of research about <laughs> did, did you train for that one? <laughs> I, yeah, I, and, and a beet farmer. I didn't like research like beet growing harvest yields and and irrigation techniques <laughs> for the sugar beet. <laughs> but um for But imagine for this, how much better you would have been had I you know, done <laughs> I know. I'm kicking myself right now. But I'm I will be I'll be brutally honest. So I play a virologist and I didn't do any research on what a virologist does or learns or anything like that. I'm sorry, I apologize, science nerds. Oh. Mm. Um mm. but because in this case and I would if I was in if it if it really was about the science. Like if this was a show where I was in the lab a lot and doing work and talking about concepts of viruses and stuff. But I start in the lab and I'm immediately like 
episode two just like launched out into the world and uh, I don't really deal with the science of it so much. So I knew it wouldn't really help my performance or my kind of authenticity to kind of dive into the research. Uh, is that because it's scripted in a way where you are more than just a scientist, you're a whole person who's interacting with a, a social ecology that's out there? Because, yeah. for example, I forgot which show it was. It was one of these doctor shows, and there's Lawrence Fishburne as the uh, the medical examiner performing autopsies, right? So mm -hmm. they don't put him out in the field too much. He, you know, when you go down into the bowels of the uh, of the uh, where they store the bodies, he's there, and so his lines have to come out convincingly to mm -hmm. what might be an audience who has fluency in the analysis of dead bodies. So mm -hmm. presumably some of your lines have to be sort of medically authentic when you mm -hmm. deliver them. Well, there, in this case, and in this case, there were really only a handful. Like I'm talking three or four lines over the entire series that needed to kind of sound uh, medically and uh, scientifically authentic. Okay. When you're doing a TV show, and you're in the milieu and you're playing a doctor or a surgeon or a specialist or something like that, you're coming back time and time again, you know, like Dr. House or something like that. Yeah, you really yeah. might need to learn some more about medicine to be able to every single episode be diving into some kind Right, of and disease. be authentic and authentically deliver the lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's got to, it's, yeah. it's got to at least sound convincing to some experts and especially in the Geekiverse, you'll be held to that. You know, that's true. You've got people... <clears throat> Who are experts or no experts or mm -hmm. or and you know i'm a big well i, I i'm known at yeah some you do levels. this in the movies all the time <laughs> i remember i watched your live tw i literally followed your live twitter feed of um was it gravity i think yeah, it was gravity, gravity, uh, gravity. Of, like everything that was right and most things that were wrong uh, it was uh it was yeah great. It, was, it was really it entertaining was mysteries of gravity that's what that was the, that was the hashtag i created yeah. for it um, but I try to give some latitude to the creative art. So people think I'm just a total, you know, nasty person to ever see a movie with. But I, th I think I'm just misunderstood, you know, in oh. my intent. <laughs> oh. Yeah, thank you. For that. You need a hug. If this were COVID, have, I, I would give you a hug. A, <laughs> air hug. We can give an air hug. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's get another question from uh, one of our uh, Patreon members. And... <clears throat> Oh, sorry, I didn't give the name of that. For that first person uh, was uh, Robert Stanley. Yes. Okay, thank so, you, Robert. Uh, and the next one is uh, Chris Hampton. And uh, these are clearly your fans. Hey, Rain. That's where I have another house, Chris Hampton. <laughs> Chris Hampton. <laughs> it's, that's east of West Hampton, right? Or, yes. right. Uh, it's like, hey, Rain. So these are like total fan, fan folks out there. Huge fan. Uh, do you ever get into deep conversations about the universe with the other actors on set? If so, who have you had the best conversations with? Oh, that's fantastic. So, so let's broaden that to just your, you know, not only Utopia, but also sure. The Office. How about that? Yeah, that's great. Um, in, in the downtime, in downtime. Yeah, what do you Yeah, do? yeah, sure we do. You know, there's a lot of downtime when you're on the set. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of like really deep uh, conversations. I the one that just popped into my mind uh, immediately was I did a long time ago. Now it's got 15 years ago. I did a role in this action uh, adventure comedy with Matthew McConaughey called Sahara. And oh, I, I missed that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a big silly romp through Morocco and explosions and camels and hidden treasure and <laughs> explosions like and camels. So, <laughs> so, uh, but that's, that's the whole move. Explosions, camels, hidden treasure. There it there's is. A, there's <laughs> a little bit more to it than that. But um, and I played a science geeky nerd in that one. But uh, I remember uh, talking to Penelope Cruz, and I was just blown away by how smart she was and how. Uh, I mean, first of all, she's like the most beautiful woman on planet Earth. So it was a little bit, my jaw was kind of dropped. But she's, you know, she speaks five languages. She runs all these orphanages. She has got university degrees. She's very well read. She's You can had, only know that in the downtime. Now that I yeah, think about it, that's how exactly. you know that. Yeah, just sipping on a coffee, eating right. on, on a sandwich. And um, we just had some, uh, we didn't have a bunch, but I just remember this one conversation where we were talking about 
you know, world peace and how to achieve it and working together and different cultures coming together and some big concepts. And I was just su- super impressed with her. I, I did not know that about Penelope Cruz, but yeah. very, very, very good to hear. Genius. I, I have Supermodel a, I have genius, a, basically. <laughs> I have a very opposite experience that I once had. Okay. Um, uh, I was filming, again, in a cameo role, and we're between takes. So, so I'm sitting in my, you know, in the, in the, in the chair, you know, the, with the, the director's chair, but of course I'm not the director. I'm just, <laughs> but that's mm-hmm. what they're called, the, the director's chair. Sure. And there's someone else, one of the other act, actors is there. And so, so there's some new photo from the Hubble telescope that had just arrived. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm excited. I'm, I'm an astrophysicist. I say, oh, have you seen this photo? There's stars being born in the middle of this gas. Gun. And just, oh, okay. And then went back to reading People magazine. Oh. And this is a person who was playing a medical doctor. And I was just so, you know, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm naive to assume that an actor is the thing that they're acting. The fact right. that they're so good at what they're portraying, making me think that they know this stuff, that's why they're a good actor. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I, it's, I, I, so I'm so torn by this reality that um, right. an actor can be completely ignorant about everything in the world and all that matters is they deliver those lines. And so, yeah. At the end of the day, actors are idiots. <laughs> you said it. You said it best no. and first. <laughs> actors are one, idiots. Just Dr. That Neil one, deGrasse Tyson. Well, well I'll, I'll say something else here. Okay, just to just to dig myself out of the hole that, that you just <laughs> that threw I dug me in, you. even though yeah. I dug the hole. Okay, so um, I remembered the in a scene she was in where she delivered a line, and the director said, "No, you need the line to be." Uh, this is a person you remember from the past and you had good memories then, but then you had later bad memories, so you have conflicted emotions. Go. And out came three lines from her. It was like, yes, it's all there in, yeah. the, in the body and the eyes and the, and the, and the gestures. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and I said, damn, damn, yeah. that's good. And yeah. so I asked her in, in, the, in the break, I said, well, so how long have you been acting? She said, well, yeah, it depends on when you want to start counting, but... Um, since I was six, <laughs> I was like, okay. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so if, so if you ask me, how long have you been thinking about the universe? It's like, since I was nine, right? I can, mm-hmm. I got that. I, and I'm, I'm totally, it. I'm all in, in the universe. Yeah. And so, yeah. so, and she was all in with the acting. And, no, I appreciate so, that. There's a, people don't, it, a great actor makes it look so easy and effortless. I always use Brad Pitt as the example. Like, it's just like. Everyone watches a Brad Pitt performance. You're like, I could do that. If I was that good looking, I could do that. I mean, he just is standing there <laughs> saying his name. Oh, that's the, that's the only thing. Separate. Yeah. If I had the, won the genetic lottery like he had, I could do it. But Brad Pitt is an, a phenomenal actor. I mean, yeah. transformative, subtle, precise, emotional. Like, his, I'm astounded at his the intelligence of his performances. All I, of I, I loved him in, in Once Upon a Time in L.A., and... And he wasn't even the star of that movie. Yeah. I mean, he was in yeah. it, but he was like a secondary kind of character. Yeah, he's, he's and, mesmerizing. So it's really complicated. And, you you know, you spend your whole life making it look really easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's, And you hope it's someone not. notices, and then you get the next gig. Yeah. Let's do one more question before we take, yeah. take, the, take the next break. So this one is from, uh, uh, this is Violetta, a 12-year-old astro nerd in Birmingham, Alabama. And my mom, Izzy, is also a nerd. <laughs> uh. <laughs> nerd, nerd, <laughs> nerd soup here. Okay, we want to know, uh, do you consider yourself a nerd? And if so, what level of nerd are you? And what's the nerdiest thing you've ever done? Thanks. Love you guys. Okay, I we only have a couple question. minutes, so this, we need a fast answer here. Okay. But, I love this question. I have a it's chess great. clock over my right shoulder. That should Damn. prove it to you. I used to be, I used to play competitive chess and I was on the chess team and we would drive around competing in chess. And once I went to a chess tournament and I saw a guy who had mold growing in his ear. That's, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. That's how nerdy I am. Okay. Uh, okay. You didn't have the mold, but someone next to you did. It means they you're did. hanging out with that crowd. I was hanging out with the crowd with a guy who had mold in his ear. That's okay. how nerdy the, I am. Boom. I'm going to answer this too. So I, I'm a nerd from way back. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, mm-hmm. but I was kind of a nerd jock. So, you know, the whole, the whole spectrum of tribalizing that goes on in high school. 
We have the jocks and the nerds. Um, in the Bronx High School of Science, everybody's a nerd. So, so the, it's, it's the nerd spectrum has shifted. The, the whole high school spectrum is shifted in the nerd direction. Mm -hmm. So everybody is a nerd. I was just a nerd jock. Then you had the nerd, the nerd nerds. Okay, they were like extra. So, so for me, uh, what's the nerdiest thing I did? I once wrote down every single number that had any significance that I knew at that moment. Ah. So, so it was a whole sheet. So it was like all the digits of pi that I knew. I also happen to know the fifth root of 100 to 12 decimal places, but that's another story. Um, uh, every phone number that I knew, including their area code, so these are 10 digit numbers. Uh, <laughs> other, other numbers, and I just wrote that, and I said, how many numbers could possibly be in my head that are just there for random access? Yeah. I filled an entire sheet. And each number has had meaning in my life. And I thought that was kind of a geeky thing to do. That that takes the cake. That's <laughs> that's 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 remarkable. I just thought maybe that was kind of geeky. Although I do Looking have back. notebooks uh, filled with my uh, God. Where, I, I wish I could just grab one right now. I've got notebooks filled with the drawings I did of my Dungeons and Dragons characters. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's yeah. good. There so. you go. Okay, Izzy. Mom Izzy and Violetta, where we are on that scale. Um, <clears throat> and just briefly, however nerdy you think you are, there are people who are way more nerdy than you are. True. And w when I finally calculated the mass of Thor's hammer, um, someone corrected my calculation and said, the actual mass of Thor's hammer. <laughs> oh, my, uh, my God. <laughs> my calculation was as geeky a thing as I've ever done with a superhero universe, and, and that is the Marvel universe, of course. And then someone out geeked me, who was a a, 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 a a material science engineer who worked for the Navy, who had all kinds of superhero paraphernalia in his office, and he he showed me the errors of my calculations. Oh man! So, and was he right? Yeah, I had to. I had to concede. <laughs> wow, good. Well, good for you that you had the humility to say, you know yeah, what, yeah, you got to, me on that. You got yeah, me. Yeah. So, so it turns out, um, I calculated that his hammer weighed the equivalent of a herd of three hundred billion elephants, and I had authentic ways to calculate that. And he said, no, it's actually made of a fictional substance called ulu, and it weighs exactly forty-two point three pounds. And my answer was so much better than that. <laughs> so, but I had to concede. I concede. And then one of All my right. fans said, no, Neil, Neil, um, they didn't say on what planet it weighs 42.3 pounds. <laughs> because you uh, weigh different amounts on different planets. Sure, but sure. But anyhow, uh, we got to take a break. And we, when we come back, Rain, if you have questions for me, that'll be the chance to ask them. Great. When Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk, Cosmic Crib. Welcome to it. And in my Cosmic Crib, I got Rain Wilson. Rain, it's been a delight in conversation with you the first time we've met. And, uh, and I'm also, I, I feel good that we've uh, exposed your geek underbelly. Yes. It's actually not your underbelly, it's all around you. <laughs> it's my it's literal a, belly. Yes. It's your literal belly, not your mm -hmm. underbelly. It's mm -hmm. on top, uh, all around you. Um, and you said you, you were an avid chess player. Did you have a, a, a ranking or a score? What, what do they call yeah, it? Yeah, I think the... um, in tournament play, I got up to around 1350, 1400. So it's not like I was like a chess genius or anything like that. Okay, but people I could aren't hold writing my movies own. about your chess prowess. No, but... no one was going to be making movies about my chess prowess. But I, <laughs> I was fourth board. I was fourth board at Shorecrest High School in, uh, in 1982. Uh, okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. and I held my own, so I did I did pretty good. All right, all right. Well, congratulations yeah. on that. And so uh, in this third segment, uh, we want I just want to probe what are the depths of your cosmic curiosity, because it's not every day someone hang, hangs out with an astrophysicist, and I want people to fully exploit that occasion if they want to. So yeah, so listen, I hear a lot from people um, about this thing that Einstein referenced: spooky action at a distance. And then I know that this is kind of a controversial concept, and I just can't wrap my head around it. I, I'm, I'm really a, a science neophyte around this stuff, and I, I really have a hard time taking science and math into my brain. But, um, you know, I know it has to do with theoretical physics and kind of some, some uh, 
experiment or some happening in one place affecting something in some other place and i'm just wondering what that means what that i always hear that and i just don't i tried to watch a youtube video on it i can't wrap my head around it i love the way you said that all right It, it predates einstein let's go back to isaac newton so when isaac newton first wrote down his equations of gravity and in these equations there's a mass term of one object and a mass term of another you multiply them together and you divide by the distance between them squared. And when you do that, that's the force of gravity between these two objects. So these two objects, at a distance from each other, feel each other's presence. Hmm. But he knew there's nothing in space. There's no cable connecting them. There are no, there's no pulleys. There, mm-hmm. It's empty. Hmm. And this deeply disturbed Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's got to be some way that they're physically connecting to each other. Hmm. But until we discover that way, I know my equations work. Hmm. So I'm sticking Hmm. with my equations, okay? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. the equations work. The orbit of the moon around the Earth, Earth around the sun, Jupiter's moons around Jupiter that you could see with a telescope. It was knocking them out of the park. But he was uncomfortable that you could have action at a distance. Hmm. And thus became this quest for, is there something else going on in space that enables these two objects to know about each other? And then we ended up exploring electromagnetism. There's another thing, action at a distance. Okay, magnet, there's a magnetic, the concept of field had to be introduced. Right, mm-hmm. and that was Faraday in the 19th century. Faraday introduced the concept as a magnetic field, and if we're going to talk about fields, we have a gravitational field. If you want to talk that way, and it's this zone out there where things can happen, but there's still the mystery of what's going on across. What is gapping that distance? Mm-hmm. And it took modern field theory to come to an understanding of it. So, but before I get to that, let's get the gravity solved. So Einstein figured out that gravity is not action at a distance. Gravity is a distortion of the fabric of space and time. And I, as a mass, am distorting space around me. And if you want to move in my space, you're going to follow that path. Mm. Mm -hmm. So Einstein is quoted as saying that mass tells space how to curve. Space tells matter how to move. Mm. So it kind of sidestepped the action at a distance question because you're just sliding up and down like, like a skateboarder on a, on, a, on, a, on a very terrain going up and down in the hole and out of the hole. That, that's what things are doing. When things are in orbit, they're just sort of falling on this curved fabric of space-time. Mm. So that kind of buys us some time on this, all right? Maybe that's all we have to do to think about gravity. With Mm -hmm. electromagnetism, we're not talking about spooky action at a distance. It's a photon is exchanged between two particles, and that creates the force. Mm -hmm. So photons carry the force of electricity and magnetism. That's modern field theory describing that. And so we're done there. So now, you folded that together with this other thing, which is wait a minute, there's something way over here and something's happening and it's not gravity and it's not electromagnetism, there's something else. That, I think, was part of your question, Mm -hmm. is the quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. And and so quantum entanglement is is where you can have two particles. You know, you heard that particles can be wave, you know, matter can be wave and particles at the same time. You might have heard about that, the wave-particle duality. Well, okay, if you create a particle you can create a pair of particles that are entangled with each other where they have complementary properties. Hmm. All right, now, separate the particles. You don't know what properties one of them has until you measure it. Mm -hmm. You just don't know. But the moment you measure it, you instantly know the the properties of the other particle because they're complementary. Okay, what one is, the other is sort of the complementary variant on that. So, if you separate these particles, and don't measure them, just separate them, put them at great distance, then the instant you measure this particle, the other particle shows up with the complementary properties. 
And so the wave is occupying that entire space. And they instantly know about each other. That is the crowning achievement of action at a distance. In mm. fact, this information communicates, this happens faster than the speed of light. It happens instantaneously. So sci-fi people are asking, is there, can you make a warp drive that'll do this instantaneously and send something, information, instantly? So there's a whole frontier of sci-fi people thinking about this phenomenon. Well, that's what I was so, going to say. Nick, that's the first thing that popped into my head is like, wait, so these two, I don't want to say elements, but these two uh, particles, things, particles, particles yeah. that have been split apart are, can connect with each other, communi not communicate like language, but there, there's a, a tension between them. You know, is, 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 is faster than light space travel a possibility? You know, other than this quantum entanglement phenomenon, um, and there are a few other, quant there's quantum tunneling, uh, which is also an instantaneous thing, but other than that, moving physical objects through space faster than the speed of light, there is no known exception to it, and highly tested laws of physics that say it's impossible. Hmm. So we're kind of stuck with that. You know, what you need, you need warp drives. You have to bend space, and then you mm -hmm. cheat by cutting across shortcuts through it hmm. or tunneling through hmm. wormholes you can do it you're not going to accomplish it by physically moving faster than light through space Got so hmm. so there you have it that's good now i'm thinking of you in in galaxy quest i, I can't shake that <laughs> <image>. <laughs> that that's, was my first role in a movie that was and you're my supporting alien act, playing actor the thermian <laughs> Lunk the thermian Thur thermian yeah yeah, yeah very but good. um very and good. so I, I another question i had for you is like what is what was your most transcendent experience in astrophysics or astronomy that was filled with the most wonder? Like what discovery or galaxy or um, experiment did you kind of witness that kind of made you gasp and uh, really stretched the <clears throat> limits of your of your wonder? Yeah, I, I like that. And I think wonder is an undervalued feature of what it is to be a scientist or to be anyone on a frontier where you have one foot in what is known and the other foot in what is yet to be discovered. Hmm. Many people fear that. They have to have an answer. They can't bask in the ignorance of the yet to be known. Hmm. And that's unfortunate because the wonder is the, to gaze upon something and say, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And, I, and let me find out. Rather than I have no idea what I'm looking at, I'm afraid, let me run back into the cave, right? Mm -hmm. These are two wholly different reactions. So for me, uh, for parts of my PhD thesis, it involved obtaining data at, on mountaintops. And I went to mountaintops in the country of Chile, where those telescopes have access to the southern hemisphere skies, where the center of the galaxy passes overhead in the middle of their winter, which is the middle of our summer. Hmm. So I would be there on the mountaintop. And this was a pilgrimage because I have to travel all these thousands of miles into the southern hemisphere. Hmm. Then you have to flip your biorhythms to go nocturnal because your sure. night becomes your day. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, so then there's this sort of physiological transformation. Then you have to regain your intellectual chops because you're about to get data that's going to plug into research that you already have in progress. Okay, so then the sun sets. There's a cloud layer that happens to roll in. Well, that cloud layer is below you because you're on a mountaintop. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now the cloud layer completely surrounds you. Hmm. And the moon is out just a little bit. So as it gets dark, there's still a little bit of light. I can see the tops of the clouds in moonlight. And I'm this island of rock with telescope domes that has ascended above this cloud layer. Mm. And there's nothing else in the world. Nothing in your sight line to the horizon, mm. except you on this mountaintop above the clouds. So it's me on Earth, but really above Earth, looking out to the universe, ready to point my telescope to the center of the galaxy, waiting for photons that have been traveling for 30,000 years, emanating from the middle of the galaxy to mm. land on my detector. 
And so, and I'm there alone. This is a very solid, well, there's a, a technician in another room, but it, 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 it is a, a moment when you are communing with the cosmos. Hmm. And uh, for me, that is the closest thing I've had to a religious spiritual moment. Hmm. Not religious in the sense of, oh, there are gods up there. No, no, just a spiritual moment where mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, in this moment, I'm not thinking of the universe. I'm feeling it. Hmm. Hmm. That's beautiful. And that's happened to me many times on the mountaintop. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's a great story. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I feel like those moments of transcendence is what we're really going for, you know. As, as as human beings on this planet like that and kind some of people makes... have never had it might not know that that is something to go for yeah, yeah so that's, that's another true. That's, that's true another that's a it's a direction ahead but i've had that yeah. same experience at a radiohead concert you oh know? okay <laughs> I, I, I did not expect <laughs> that's you to say that uh, i've okay, had that same right. experience uh mm. you know camping and being in the wilderness and seeing the stars mm -hmm. um i've had that same experience the birth of my son um, but those moments. Okay, wait. Of, does your son know that you've analogized his birth to a Radiohead concert? Just he would have be you thrilled. Disclosed this. <laughs> He's a huge Radiohead fan. He's sixteen. Okay. He's already seen them in concert twice. He would okay. be thrilled. <laughs> All right. Well, dude, that's. An, I, I love that question, and thanks for 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 uh, em, empowering me to relive that moment, which was very special for me. Uh, dude, we got to get you back on at another time. I don't think we plumbed all of the nerd space that we're capable of reaching. Happy but to come Rain, back anytime. Rain Wilson, thank you for being on Star Talk. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, you're very welcome. All right. This has been Star Talk. Let's call it the Rain Wilson edition. Uh, I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, as always, bidding you to keep looking up.